In some very important respects, it is accurate to speak of Christian faiths as opposed to one single Christian faith. This becomes obvious when we read the Christian message from the various writers of the books of the New Testament. There is a reason, for example, why our Bible contains not one, but four different gospel accounts of the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Add to that the differences in perspective of the various epistle writers, and you can see that the one Christian faith can be said to be composed of different strands, each one with a distinctive flavor and which, taken together, weave an intricate tapestry. Last week we walked through the three Johannine letters with their strong message of separation from the world. For the rest of this week, I'm going to walk through the short letter, 1 Timothy, which is the epistle selection for this week in the daily lectionary. As we'll see, it has a dramatically different perspective regarding the world. Hello, I'm Stuart Baskin, pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Tyler, Texas, and this is your daily devotional for Tuesday, May 28th, 2024. It is impossible to say with complete certainty who wrote this letter. It is written in Paul's name to a younger colleague, but there are enough questions about the time and place of its writing to give many scholars pause in attributing it to, to the apostle. But as we have seen elsewhere, this is not an especially important point. Whether written by Paul or by someone else under his name, the letter itself carries an important message for the church. The letter reads about the way you'd expect for a personal letter. The writer, whom we'll call Paul for convenience, dispenses nuggets of wisdom to his younger co colleague, Timothy. After a brief section on the law, Paul turns to the question of the saving work of Jesus Christ. There is one verse in particular that you will instantly recognize. He writes, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example of those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. Paul, referring to his earlier history as a persecutor of the church, shows how Christ's grace and mercy extend even to people like him. In spite of his history, Christ claimed him and redeemed him. This, he claims, forms the very basis of his ministry. Basically, if Christ can save someone like him, is there anyone Christ cannot save? Paul then turns his attention to more practical matters, beginning with a big one. How do Christians relate to an often hostile world? Is it along the lines of the Johannine community we saw last week? Or is it more consistent with what Paul wrote in Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except for God? Listen to this brief section from 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all then, he writes, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings, and for all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Clearly, this is not from the Johannine community. One can hardly imagine John urging prayers, including prayers of thanksgiving for the governing authorities. But in this community, Respect for those in positions of power and government is the order of the day. Like I said earlier, there are clearly different versions of Christian faith and life on exhibit in the New Testament. The question is, what do we do with that? For my money, 
We hold these different attitudes and perspectives in tension with one another, treating them as different voices in an ongoing and vibrant conversation about what it means to believe and to live a life of faithful Christian discipleship. And while I myself tend toward the Pauline side of things, rejecting the Johannine side of the conversation is not healthy. Both voices are important for a vibrant faith. Tomorrow, the rather mundane question of qualifications for church offices. But for now, may God continue to bless you and keep you in all that you do this day and in all the days ahead.